Hello. First, I'd just like to address our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My Lord and my God, I adore you. I love you, and I believe you are truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most holy Eucharist. Jesus is indeed the divine physician, and you and I have come to be with him today. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 24, we heard these words. So when the people saw that Jesus was not there, they themselves got into the boats and went to compare them, seeking Jesus. Today, you and I come seeking Jesus. And we have found Him truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most holy Eucharist. We have come to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Prince of Peace. When you and I worship the Prince of Peace, He fills our heart with peace. A peace which surpasses all understanding. A peace which fills you and me with courage to proclaim and defend religious freedom. Blessed John Paul the Great was the great defender of religious freedom. John Paul the Great at the age of 20 was an underground, or age of 22 was an underground seminarian during World War II. He risked his life daily for the faith. Then he was ordained a priest, and at age 38 was made the youngest bishop in Poland. Then at 44, the Archbishop of Krakow. He learned how to live under a communist regime. He learned how to defend and proclaim his faith. He did not let a totalitarian government subdue him. And he and Cardinal Vicente led their people. For as John Paul has said, no government has the right. Well, first he said, religious freedom is our first and fundamental freedom given by God. Your right to love God is given by God. Your right to worship God is given by God. And no government can take it away. Amen? John Paul the Great, he really was great, wasn't he? And we all know him, we all love him. And he's here with us today, alongside him in his blessed mother Teresa one of his best friends when the two of them walked this earth together to defending life and to defending religious freedom. Well, if you recall, back in 1979, less than one year after he'd been elected Pope, the people of Poland invited him to come to Poland, and the Communist authority could not deny it. Why? How can you deny the first man from your country elected Pope. You, those communists would have looked like fools if they would have said that John Paul II could not come to his homeland as Pope. And so begrudgingly the authorities let him in the door. That was their first mistake. <laughs> because John Paul II proceeded to have a huge outdoor mass in Victory Square in Warsaw. And you know what? One million people came to that Mass. And John Paul II gave one of the greatest homilies of his life that day. For he looked at his beloved countrymen and he said, what I just said, religious freedom is our first and fundamental freedom given to us by God. And no government can take that away. And then he looked at his people and he said something very penetrating and challenging and dynamic. He looked at his own countrymen and he said, We must stop living lies. 
Everybody knew the government, government was lying to them, so they lied, lied back to the government. But he said, we must stop living lies, we must live in the truth. And as he expounded the meaning of that, spontaneously, one million people began to chant, we want God. We want God. We want God. Amen? Amen. And they went on for five minutes. It was such a crescendo that the hotels surrounding the square were feeling the power of their voice. And a communist TV journalist up in like the second or third floor of a hotel, he turned to a communist official and he said, we've lost. Amen? They realized that the people no longer fear the communists. Amen? And we do not fear those seek to deny us our religious freedom. Amen? Amen. We are going to stand with John Paul the Great. We are going to affirm our faith. We are going to live that faith no matter what the cost. And you know what? When you follow Jesus Christ, hang on here. Testing. Testing. Let me get into the next page. <laughs> when you and I follow Jesus Christ, we're willing to pay the price. Whatever it takes. Because just like those people in Victory Square said, we want God, you and I hunger and thirst for God. And in the most holy Eucharist, we find him. As Jesus said today in the Gospels, quote, Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. That food, the Eucharist, is a foretaste of heavenly glory. And when we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, he lives in you. He lives in me. He transforms you. He transforms me. He makes you and me like himself. And this is what you and I saw in the life of John Paul the Great. A man so in love with Jesus, so transformed by Jesus, that when he stepped, stepped out on the balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square, addressing the huge crowd after having just been elected Pope, he said, Be not afraid. Be not afraid to open the door of your hearts to Jesus Christ, to open the boundaries of the countries, economic systems, and cultures to Jesus Christ. Be not afraid. These are the words of Jesus to you and me today. Be not afraid to proclaim your belief in Jesus. In John 6.29, Jesus says, This is the work of God, and if you believe in Him, He has sent. Our right to exercise our religious freedom not only impels us to defend it, but also to proclaim it, to put it in common language. Some people think we have a problem today because the government is trying to take our, away our religious freedom. But if you're a Christian, every problem is not a problem, it's an opportunity. And this is an opportunity to proclaim the new evangelization. You could say that this is the Catholic moment. This is the moment for you and me to bring Jesus Christ to the agnostic. This is the moment for you and me to bring Jesus Christ to the atheist. And first and foremost, this is the opportunity for you and me to bring Jesus Christ to our persecutors. Amen? Get ready for some big time conversions. Amen? Because when you and I kneel before Jesus Christ, and proclaim him King of Kings, his power goes forth, and his power is real.
and His power is infinite. Amen? Amen. And therefore, be not afraid to shout from the housetops that Jesus Christ is alive, that He seeks the life and the soul of every man and every woman, and He alone is Lord, He alone is our Savior, and He alone loves each one of us with an everlasting love. Indeed, Jesus in the Eucharist is our greatest treasure. And Mary, his mother, leads us to Jesus in the Eucharist, just as she is doing today. You see this beautiful local living rosary out there. And we'll have all kinds of young people being living beings. We will be praying the rosary, contemplating Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. We will be praying with Mary to Jesus. And because she is his mother, her prayer is more powerful than all of ours combined. Her prayer is more powerful than all the saints of all times combined. Why is that? Because at the moment of her conception, or from the moment of her conception, she was protected from original sin. She was redeemed. It was called preservative redemption because God the Father took the saving merits of Jesus on the cross and applied it backwards in time. How can he do that? He's God. He lives out of time. So he can do that, and that's what he did. So from the moment of her conception, she was preserved from original sin. What does that mean? That means from the moment of her conception, she was perfectly united with God. And because she never sinned, she continued to be perfectly united with God. And she continues to be perfectly united with God. And so her prayer, her intercession, is perfect intercession. That's why we ask the mother of God to pray with us. That's why when we pray with her to her son, we receive a superabundant of blessings. That's part of why we come today. Now, on May 13, 1917, God sent the Virgin Mary to the three young shepherd children in Fatima, Portugal. And it just happens that I'm looking at some young children today. So I need your help. The first young person was 10 years old, named Lucia. Stand up if you're a 10 year old young person. Look at that 10 year old boy and that girl. Stay standing. The, the next, next one was an eight-year-old named Francisco. Stand up if you're eight years old. Do you have an eight-year-old here? There's an eight-year-old right there. Isn't she tall? And then the littlest one was Jacinta. She was only seven. Do you have a seven-year-old? How old are you? She's nine. Okay. How old is she? Nine? All right. Next year I need a seven-year-old. Hello? Okay. okay. The reason why I port him, uh, sight these young people and have them stand up is that if you saw their size, you might not have even been able to see them from where you are because they're all under five feet. But these are the ones that the Virgin Mary chose to give an important message to. And what was her message? She told Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta to pray the rosary daily. To pray the rosary every day for world peace. And at that time in 1917, World War I had been going on for three years. One million men had died already. And it didn't look like it was going to stop. But she said that those children and everyone else would pray the rosary every day, that war would stop. And within one year, well, first of all, the children responded and prayed the rosary daily with great intensity. And they proclaimed Our Lady's message to the world. And within one year, the war did stop. But if you recall at Fatima, Our Lady appeared first in May, then in June, then in July, then in August. But her August apparition was supposed to happen on the 17th, but it didn't. Why? Because the secular authorities took those three little children, stand up, eight and nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds. 
head up so we can see what those authorities did. They took little children like, or young children like this, and they took them down to the police department, and they separated them. And the mayor told each one of them separately, I am going to throw you in boiling water unless you deny these apparitions. First Lucia, she says, no, I will not deny. She gets moved to the next room. They bring in Francisco. I'm going to throw you in boiling water. You do not deny these apparitions. He said, go ahead and kill me. I'm not, not going to tell a lie. And, and so, so he got, got moved to the next room, room and then he brought in little Jacinta. Can you imagine that? A big bully mayor telling children this size is going to throw them in boiling water unless they deny the apparition of our lady. But even little Jacinta said, no, I won't deny. So she, she got, got sent to the next room. room. Well, that big bully mayor, he didn't throw him in boiling water because he knew something worse than that would have happened to him when the crowd got a hold of him. And so those children proceeded to pray, and they went in August where the birth into the field where the virgin appeared. They went in September when the virgin appeared, and then on October 13th, that was going to be the date of the last apparition. The Virgin said to them, on this day will be the miracle. It will be a miracle that the whole world will be able to see in terms of witness. And so on that day, the three children, they walked out into the barren field of Fatima. And that day was somewhat like this day. The rain was pouring down, only ten times harder than this. The field was all mud. People were up almost to their knees in mud. And, and people, people were laughing at the children, saying, your virgin is in the period today, hey, look at this rain. And there were 70,000 people there that day that had come from all over Europe. And the children, they didn't care what the people were saying. They went to the tree where the virgin used to appear. And then she appeared and they knelt down and prayed. And then all of a sudden the sky opened. And the sun shone and it began to dance back and forth and then it died down at everybody. Where's your microphone? The sun died at everybody and they all hit the ground screaming, thinking the world was coming to an end. And then just as suddenly they looked back up and the sun was fixed in the sky. And they touched their clothes and they were blown dry. And the mud had turned back into the dry dirt. That, my friends, was the miracle of the sun. October 13, 1917. You can Google it and read about it in the great newspapers of Europe because they had reporters there that day and they gave eyewitness reports that appeared on the front page the next day. Our Lady of Fatima is real. Our Lady of Fatima is the Mother of God. And Our Lady of Fatima is continuing to invite you and me to pray the rosary every day for world peace. What did John Paul II say we do when we pray the rosary? When you and I pray the rosary, we contemplate the face of Jesus through the eyes of the bear. We contemplate the entire life of Jesus. And as we contemplate Him, He unites us with Himself. And because he is the Prince of Peace, he gives us his peace. He gives it to us as an individual. He gives it to us as a family. He gives it to us as a nation. He gives it to us as a world. Amen? But you and I must do our part. You and I must truly pray the rosary daily. Pray the rosary every day. And so I invite you today, you will come. I invite you to make a commitment to pray the daily rosary. And I, we have a little help out there. There's two women that are feet by a table somewhere as you go to the parking lot. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, there's two women, Mary Gail and Deanne, that have scripture rosary DVDs. They're making it available today if you just throw any donation in your little box that you want. But the Scripture Rosary DVD, you put it into your, your DVD player, and then up pops 
you can choose which set of histories you want to do. You click on it. And for every bead of the rosary, there's a different image. For every bead of the rosary, there's a different scripture verse describing the mystery. If you put that into your DVD player and click on the button, 25 minutes later, both the image and the scripture verse advance automatically every 15 seconds. So if you put that in your DVD player, click it, click on it, 25 minutes later you will have played, prayed five minutes of the rosary. We call this the game sheet. Because it allows the family to pray together, looking at the images of Jesus and Mary, and to allow those scripture verses to transform your mind, allow those you know, word of God to strengthen in your will, and allow the word of God to bring healing to your heart. Pray the rosary daily. Pray the rosary every day. Now I think I'm ready for my clothes. Just, Just remember, remember how John Paul II told the people in, in Warsaw Square, Square, stop living lies. And, and the children of the Fatima refused to live a lie or tell a lie and deny our lady's apparition. Well, you and I, we also refuse to live a lie. We refuse to let a government take away our religious freedom. Amen? Amen. And so, so, like the, the children, we might have to go to jail, some of us. But, but no, no iron bars will ever bind the freedom in our hearts. No iron bars will ever shame, will ever chain our minds to the simplified anti-human dictates of government. Why? Because we know the truth. And the truth has set us free. Because we know Jesus. Christ, who is the truth, who is the way, who is the life. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So let us, let you, let me, lift high the cross of the cross. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most holy Eucharist. And, and let us follow him. For if you and I follow him, he will be to victory. If you and I follow him, he will be to victory. And if you and I follow him, he will do something even better than that. For in the Gospel of the day, in chapter 40, he said, in verse 40, he said, quote, Indeed, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks upon the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Amen.